Right, guys. Uh, can you can you see the slides? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so welcome again. Um, again, the topic of this presentation is going to be a framework for unified authorization in Elixir, um, which is kind of self-explanatory. But I'm going to uh, explain this both on uh, on a a bit theoretical level uh, from the, at the beginning uh, about different approaches to, well, conceptual approaches to authorization in, uh, in applications, uh, and then uh, proceed to, uh, to a solution that we are working on. But let's not, um, let's not get too far right now. Uh, so um, yeah, the outline of this presentation basically is uh, first an overview of the topic. Uh, of different authorization models uh, of, and permission control uh, paradigms. Uh, then we are going to review existing solutions in the Elixir ecosystem. Then we are going to discuss why all of them suck, but uh, this doesn't mean their authors didn't do a great job. Um, I think there is a lot of uh, libraries out there who's, um, who are very good for a specific set of purposes, but um i always found myself uh trying to come up with something else for whatever reason and i'm gonna to i'm gonna tell you about uh what reasons uh stood behind the decision to uh create something new uh so at the at the end i'm gonna show a bit about the proposed solution and its development um, so briefly about me, uh, I am a co-founder co on site Shimon and CTO at Curiosum. Um, I consider myself uh, a problem solver and I like solving problems by simple solutions. Uh, so that's basically um, something that well describes me in a nutshell basically. So so yeah, that's that's about me. Uh, yeah, so so uh, let's go go on to the overview of the topic. As I said, uh, many people, well, beginners in the uh, programming world, confuse uh, authentication with authorization. So let's uh, let's restrict it, this to to just this slide uh, to um, so that there's no confusion about this. So authentication is about verifying who someone is, and authorization is verifying what someone can perform or access going to talk about the first uh, thing, authentication, only about authorization today. So uh, basically, throughout the presentation, we always will assume that we know who the user is, but we want to know uh, what they are authorized to. Um, and well, kind of a cliche from me, uh, there is no non-trivial application that doesn't deal with authorization or permission control, right? Uh, any application that you're going to write um, in, uh, well, which which has a non-trivial business domain will have to deal with uh, authorization to some extent. Um, and how can it do that? Uh, uh, well, there are several models that we can, um, we can use. Uh, for example, mandatory access control called MAC. Uh, is limiting access to resources based on the sensitivity of the information in an object and the sensitivity level a subject is authorized for. So this is one model that we can use. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is what, for example, SE Linux use, uses in, uh, in operating systems. Uh, then uh, discretionary access control. Uh, and what? why do we see an anterior cruciate ligament here? Because Coincidentally, it's it's uh, it's got the same acronym as ACL, which is Access Control List, and this is what this access control model relies on. Um, each individual resource in the system has a defined ACL, uh, which contains uh, privilege definition entries for each user of the system. So this is, for example, what uh, operating systems use, and that's well, that's uh, used in Linux, Windows, etc. Uh, to 
to specify that, for example, this user can can uh, can do a specific level of actions on a specific file, for example, or a directory. Uh, then we have role-based access control, uh, in which we talk about subjects being only able to exercise a permission only if the permission is authorized for the subject's active role. So, for example, if you're a, um, let's say, if you're a reviewer of something, that then you can create a review on for an item. Uh, yeah. And moving on from this, we have uh, attribute-based access control. So this, this is an evolution from RBAC, uh, which adds the consideration of additional attributes, which can be checked on both users uh, who are named subjects and resources who are named also objects. Um, so different authorization models can be used together. For example, in operating systems, DAC uh, is responsible for ACLs on files. MAC is the SV Linux thing and RBAC can be uh, achieved via uh, group membership and privileges. Um, and well, um, in an operating system intended for covering a broad range of business domains, uh, it is beneficial for all those, all those authorization models to uh, have their specific applications and coexist together. But in enterprise systems, it's, uh, yeah, likewise in enterprise systems, it's not unusual to see uh, those systems mixed in some way, like RBAC and DEC. Uh, but the ABAC model, also called PBAC, uh, is very well, well suited for applications which use relational databases in which uh, items have attributes defined as database columns and stuff like that. Uh, and as an, an interesting feature of ABAC is that uh, both DEC and RBAC uh, can be achieved with properly modeling conditions in the uh, attribute-based access control. So, uh, for example, um, modeling ACL with ABAC uh, means that uh, we have this kind of rules where a user which has a specific ID uh, can only access a specific document if uh, if the user has, uh, if if there exists a record uh, which describes the user's permission, and this record has the ID of that document, that user, and for example, if we want to check the read permission, that we then we uh, check for the uh, read annotation in that record. Uh, MAC is something that we can also model using ABAC. Uh, in this case, um, let's say that a user with a specific privilege level can only access documents uh, with the same or lower sensitivity level specified for them, right? So, uh, therefore, the conclusion is that ABAC is a very general model. Uh, and as many other models can be reduced to that, it's a good choice for uh, being the basis of an authorization framework that covers uh, a lot of different scenarios. Uh, so uh, here comes Elixir, and Elixir has some uh, interesting traits that uh, we are going to consider. First of all, uh, pattern matching makes it easy to define rules as plain Elixir functions, and we uh, some of you may know the library CanCan from the Ruby ecosystem. And, uh, well, it allows you to define uh, permissions like can read, uh, for example, document uh, with ID equal to, with, with user ID equal to, for example, current user ID. And this was a, um, this was a DSL uh, because there was no pattern matching syntax in, in Ruby. 
And we are going to uh, show in a moment that making these kind of predicates in Elixir is very simple. And many authorization frameworks that I found actually utilize this, but I'm also going to talk about why it's not always uh, a good choice, but uh, let's wait for that. Uh, and macros make it tempting to create very nice and human readable DSLs, but uh, I say please don't because um, I think a plain Elixir syntax is beautiful enough and powerful enough uh, not to need any DSLs for this. And uh, more often than not, they, they, they cause more problems than, uh, than they solve problems, actually. Um, so as a conceptual example in plain Elixir, uh, on the left, we have an example of, I call it predicate-based permissions, uh, in which we uh, specify that a user at a specific level, which we uh, kind of destructure by pattern matching, can read a document on a given level, which we also destructure by pattern matching, if user level is greater than or equal to the document level. And uh, as a fallback, we uh, just answer false to this can question. See how simple it is? Uh, basically, you could, uh, well, if someone of you knows Prolog, which was uh, a language which uh, Erlang kind of originated from, uh, then Prolog was all about writing these kind of predicates. Uh, yeah, so that's one way to do this kind of stuff. And the other way is to uh, build those permissions, model those permissions as data structures. So we import some module which has uh, a few utility functions which actually construct uh, structs, maps, and this kind of stuff which contain authorization data which then we can process. So um, in this definition, we destructure uh, a specific user level from, uh, from a given user. And then we, we use this ground function to, to build the basic uh, structure that we want to use. And then we use the read function to put a read privilege for the user on a document whose level is, and you see it doesn't really look as nice at, uh, as, uh, as in the example at the left. Uh, but it has several other uh, benefits that, that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, so the pros and cons of both. Uh, Predicate-based permissions are very simple to, to write and read. Uh, pattern matching works, uh, well, helps a lot here. No DSL, which is a good thing. Uh, simple, well, both simple and um, complex uh, conditions can be uh, very easily implemented. But uh, it's not flexible and it means that it the conditions can't be reflected on you can't for example uh get a list of what a specific uh user is permitted to do on a specific item and uh if you know can can from from the ruby on race world you know what it means in terms of as being able to create some some features like for example constructing uh accessibility scopes of records um because cancan has this option and th i i find this really sorely lacking in in many of the solutions existing in elixir uh, so moving on to structural permission building uh also no no pesky dsls just plain elixir pattern matching makes life easy uh data can be reflected on and processed uh in any feasible way but it does require some additional work to uh build and check permission structures against objects uh hence the need to import a a module there uh and also to implement a can question mark um function and it also has to provide specific um but still plain Elixir syntax for comparisons and these kind of stuff, just like here. Uh, 
we need to uh, be able to, to compare user levels to a document level here. Um, we can also provide a functional syntax, which we won't be able to reflect on, but if someone wants to use it, it's, it's going to be possible. Uh, yeah, so uh, considering this, uh, I went for structural permission building because um, it gives me way more possibilities in the future to build a library which, uh, for example, constructs specific actor queries based on uh, based on user permissions. And the syntax, uh, once the library is there, is um, potentially readable enough and still quite nice uh, to be attractive to, to, to the programmer. Uh, yeah, so what else, uh, what other features we look for uh, when, when looking for authorization libraries? Uh, we would like the solution to be easy to inject in different contexts. For example, most of the libraries I'm going to describe, uh, apart from those which are, well, maybe absent specific or stuff like this, or just don't care about that, most of those are easily uh, integratable with plug, uh, which is good in its own right, but uh, I, have, I have never seen a library which uh, cares about live view. Um, and out of the, the libraries that I will present, only one can do both plug and upsync, which is kind of disappointing. Uh, and also, what about uh, building scopes of accessible objects based on a permission set? We'll get to that. Uh, so, for example, you have Sheriff, which uses a very simple predicate-based permission model, has plug integration, and define and lets you define loader functions uh, for for data. Uh, so you can, for example, preload a record. Uh, in a controller action. Um, and the library is um, intentionally slim and nice, but without much uh, potential to uh, for its development. So uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Canada, it's a plain Elixir um, library which uh, in which you implement a protocol for each subject, uh, for example, a user uh, and its permissions as implementations of the CAN question mark uh, function. Uh, but obviously, you don't have the possibility to reflect on those permissions. So let's move on uh, further. Uh, Canary is an integration of Canada with Black, but it's coupled to the Phoenix model concept, which is obsolete and doesn't have any API to define uh, record loaders for controller functions. Uh, policy Wonk um does integrate with black and does allow defining resource loaders but it seems one key in usage uh bodyguard it's an interesting library which which has a nicely uh flexible plug setup with getter functions um and well getter functions are basically uh functions that uh, customize the behavior of this library by taking con as an argument so based on what's happening in con you can customize the behavior of the authorization um, any way you want to. And it has an interesting trait uh, in being able to define schema scopes as actor queries, which is good because you can query accessible records for a given user. But uh, the query definition is not coupled to the permission rule definitions which are predicate based. So, so, so you can end up in a situation when you create a um, accessible scope for, uh, for example, documents accessible by a given user, but it's, well, the conditions there are mismatched with the conditions that you define as predicates, uh, which is not good. Uh, Speakeasy is an integration of bodyguard with AppSync 
providing middleware for authentication, resource loading, and authorization. Um, which is promising, and and that that's why I said that uh, bodyguard is is basically interesting. But um, well, it's merely uh, an addition to uh, to the main bodyguard library, and won't fix any of its problems. Uh, then Raiska, uh, there is no animation on the left, so that's a pity because um, well, it's it displays the outcome of a typical attempt to make Raiska, Data Loader, and Relay work together. Uh, this is a purely GraphQL specific one. And well, it's it's interesting, but it jumps into the well, the bandwagon of a DSL heavy things and uh, makes a lot of compile time checks and other annoying stuff. So it's not something I'm a fan of, actually. Uh, then you have authorized.ex, which is a DSL. And well, basically, I don't want to use this kind of stuff in uh, in my projects. Uh, I've got enough of DSLs, I think. Uh, it also has a nice uh, behavior of returning descriptive authorization errors because you uh, you write the rules in groups that are always named. So you, so when, when you get an error, you always get uh, a message on what went wrong, kind of similar to what's going on in Ecto change sets. But in Ecto change sets, you get multiple errors uh, because mo multiple things can fail uh, at once. And here you get only one. Uh, so uh, inside it's 100% function based or predicate based, so to speak. So no, uh, no hope of uh, generating scopes and no no way to define scopes, and it doesn't really have any integration with plug. So um, maybe for some applications which don't really care about anything plug or Phoenix related, it's okay. Uh, Terminator is another DSL. Uh, which connects with plug, AppSync, and Iberoth. So it's kind of interesting for some projects. But when I looked at the syntax of this, uh, this library, I think it looks too opinionated to me. And the problem if, with, with, with the, the, the libraries, which, which are very opinionated in the way um, you are supposed to, to structure your permission model and this kind of stuff is that it's really hard to plug it into a uh, an existing project, I think. Uh, so uh, basically, I think there is no existing authorization library for Elixir that can do uh, automatic query building for scoping records, which are accessible by the current user. Uh, and none of the libraries actually supports live view in any way. And this is a pain because you can easily, uh, well, uh, obviously you can't use plug in inside uh, live views, but uh, you can use hooks and you can easily, well, tap into the mounting phase or the handle params phase and check based on the currently accessed route what the current action is which is which lives in the live action assign and then based on that just behave similarly to what we do in plug right so we either uh, continue and assign as an authorized record or maybe just halt uh, and don't proceed further uh, so a proposed solution that I've been working on for some time now, um, several months in an on, on and off basis, is to create a library which uh, provides a plain Elixir way to define permissions using a structural way of doing things, uh, which will allow us to construct active queries automatically in the future. Uh, 
defining permissions using a model that I call CRUD plus. I'll explain it in a moment. Uh, also, uh, an environment agnostic authorization resolution mechanism, uh, which I will also ex explain uh, shortly. Uh, and last but not least, uh, integrated with Black, Live View, AppSync, and integrable with others. So, uh, with regard to structural permissions building, uh, why I chose it, as I said, it allows us to reflect on the permission definitions and construct ecto queries based on them. And, uh, well, uh, as a function-based syntax will also be provided, but obviously we won't be able to uh, translate this into ecto queries. So, as, as we can see in this example, uh, we define uh, permissions for a user with a given level. Uh, and we grant a specific user to uh, a permission to read a document whose level is lower or equal than the user's level. And in a functional way, we also grant the user a permission to access a document uh, which well, we have a subject and an object. So the subject is a user, the object is a document, and then uh, we can provide a condition that the object needs to, needs to satisfy. But um, calling this, well, we have we have the ability to to call an accessible by function here, uh, which constructs an ecto query, and it does take into account the user level here. Uh, created from uh, this LTE user level um, condition, but it doesn't consider the function in the line below because there's basically no way to, to do so. Uh, the CRUD plus model, uh, it's intended to be environment agnostic. Uh, the library doesn't have an assumption of being used of um, in any specific context, like AppSync, things, things, controllers, live view, and stuff like this. Uh, so we are going to stick to create, read, update, and delete as kind of idiomatic stuff that people know well. And uh, it's going to be easy to reason about, uh, develop, and then read by someone else. Uh, but if someone's got an action which doesn't fit any of those verbs, then the developer will be able to uh, either map an action to one of the crude letters. So we have the controller configuration here, and we have a crude action mapping par uh, parameter here option, which maps the view action of this controller to the read verb. So this action will be authorized using the read permission. Uh, and if this action is not mapped to any of the letters in crude, then uh, the developer will be able to specify uh, a permission like grant the user the ability to perform review on a document like, like described in the in the line in the can function here. Um, so this action will be uh, authorized using the, uh, so the review action will be authorized using the review permission, right? Uh, so uh, with regard to the environment agnostic authorization resolution, uh, we'd like the permissions to be defined once for the application domain's business logic, and then regardless of uh, what um, framework, what what method is used to access the data? Uh, we want these uh, these rules to remain valid. So we want a mechanism which uh, integrates the permissions definitions with all the frameworks that uh, an application uses. So so if there's uh, plain Phoenix controllers in the application live view, AppSync, and whatever else we want to uh, we want to be able to use, to reuse uh, 
the original permission set. So resolving the yes, no answer for authorization and the resource record that is authorized against um, should be decoupled from any specific framework. And uh, the same goes to resolving permission names. So uh, for example, live view will know that both a show live action and a show controller action, um, which is a Phoenix controller action name should ask for the read permission. And um, there is there is going to be a resolver module, which will take uh, the subject, take the object, take the permission set, and they take the action name. And the resolver will be adaptable for whatever framework one intends to use, right? Because it's going to answer yes or no, and optionally preload a resource to be authorized against. Uh, and with regard to plug and live integrations, uh, obviously we want to uh, cater to the needs of uh, Phoenix developers, uh, as well as those who, who prefer to use Phoenix Live View, uh, which doesn't really have any framework which uh, has any degree of integration. And, and as I said, um, Sim we, plug integration will work similarly to the existing libraries and live view integration, which uh, will use hooks to uh, tap into the on mount and handle params life cycles. Uh, so, this is an example. Uh, we can't plug stuff, so we'll have to do something that we can, for example, use. A module here we refer to a module that configures the authorization for the application and also contains permissions um, we specify that that the resource module that we talk about is document here and we can provide a, a function for example from our context that loads the uh, the document before a specific life cycle uh, occurs and uh, we will have a default implementation of what happens when when um, when the user is not authorized to to perform an action, and the default implementation is going to be this. Uh, so if we are mounting, then we are going to redirect the user to a specific fallback path, with, with, which we can configure, and. Uh, if we are not mounting, which means it's a handle params lifecycle, we will assign unauthorized to the socket and halt. So handle params uh, function will not be called at all. Uh, so about others, definitely absent comes to mind, um, but this requires us to think about it th thoroughly because, uh, well, um Raiska does a quite interesting job here uh providing mechanisms to authorize separately objects fields and queries and we will have to think about um how to deal with the action name thing in uh in absent when when it comes to integrating this with the uh authorization resolver that I talked about um, so what's done so far? Uh, my current implementation includes the uh, plain elixir and structure of permission building, but it doesn't really have the uh, actor query automatic construction uh, implemented yet, but it's possible to, to do so, as I said. Uh, we can define permissions uh, using a crude model, but the plus thing is not implemented yet. So uh, the custom action names are not uh, not supported at this moment. Um, the authorization resolution me mechanism is already coded as an environment agnostic mechanism. So um, it's only a matter of providing specific adapters for this. Uh, and we have plug and live view integrations, uh, but not absent yet at this moment. And um, while it's now 
an internal development uh, project that we we have uh, at our company. We are work, working on making this a project which is open sourced and community driven. So um, I hope some of you are interested in uh, supporting this effort. So uh, please contact us if you're indeed interested in uh, helping us make it uh, well. Um, make it a good library uh, and I think we will make it open source soon. So um, yeah, keep in touch with us and we'll let you know what the status of this is uh, in the near future because um, different versions of this are already used in some of our projects that we have uh, with kind of a good, good results. So um yeah that's why we thought it would be good to make this open source and accessible for many different applications um all right uh i think it's the content of the presentation is over so let's now uh i would say let's now move on to the q a but i don't see any specific questions for this presentation yet. So if someone's got any question, then we now have a few minutes to, um, to ask them. Are the slides available? Uh, well, basically the slides, not really. Uh, I think, uh, well, anyway, it will be uh, it will be uploaded to YouTube. And if um, if someone wants me to to, uh, to share the slides with him, then um, please contact me and I can do so. But basically, uh, we we. You know, we tend to just um, upload the recordings to YouTube after those meetups. So please, uh, please just visit our YouTube channel soon and there's gonna be a recording of this. <laughs> 